moments of being. Slater's pins have no points, Virginia Woolf. Slater's pins have no points don't you always find that? said Miss Cray, turning round as the rose fell out of Fanny Wilmot's dress, and Fanny stooped, with her ears full of the music, to look for the pin on the floor. The words gave her an extraordinary shock, as Miss Gray struck the last chord of the Bach fugue. Did Miss Gray actually go to Slater's and buy pins then? Fanny Wilmot asked herself, transfixed for a moment. Did she stand at the counter waiting like anybody else, and was she given a bill with coppers wrapped in it, and did she slip them into her purse and then, an hour later, stand by her dressing table and take out the pins? What need had she of pins? for she was not so much dressed as cased, like a beetle compactly in its sheath, blue in winter, green in summer. What need had she of pins Julia Cray who lived, it seemed in the cool glassy world of bark fugues, playing to herself what she liked, to take one or two pupils at the one and only consenting Archer Street College of Music, so the principal, Miss Kingston, said, as a special favour to herself, who had the greatest admiration for her in every way. Miss Cray was left badly off, Miss Kingston was afraid, at her brother's death. Oh! They used to have such lovely things, when they lived at Salisbury, and her brother Julius was, of course, a very well-known man, a famous archaeologist. It was a great privilege to stay with them, Miss Kingston said, my family had always known them they were regular Canterbury people, Miss Kingston said, but a little frightening for a child. One had to be careful not to slam the door or bounce into the room unexpectedly. Miss Kingston, who gave little character sketches like this on the first day of term while she received checks and wrote out receipts for them, smiled here. Yes, she had been rather a tomboy, she had bounced in and set all those green Roman glasses and things jumping in their case. The Crays were not used to children. The Crays were none of them married. They kept cats, the cats, one used to feel knew as much about the Roman urns and things as anybody, far more than I did," said Miss Kingston brightly, writing her name across the stamp in her dashing, cheerful, full-bodied hand, for she had always been practical. That was how she made her living, after all. Perhaps then, Fanny Wilmot thought, looking for the pin, Miss Gray said that about Slater's pins having no points, at a venture. None of the Crays had ever married. She knew nothing about pins nothing whatever but she wanted to break the spell that had fallen on the house, to break the pane of glass which separated them from other people. When Polly Kingston, that merry little girl, had slammed the door and made the Roman vases jump, Julius, seeing that no harm was done, that would be his first instinct, looked, for the case was stood in the window, at Polly skipping home across the fields, looked with the look his sister, often had, that lingering, driving look, stars, sun, moon, it seemed to say, the daisy in the grass, fires, frost on the window pane, my heart goes out to you. But, it always seemed to add, you break, you pass, you go. And simultaneously it covered the intensity of both these states of mind with I can't reach you I can't get at you, spoken wistfully, frustratedly. And the stars faded, and the child went. That was the kind of spell that was the glassy surface, that Miss Cray wanted to break by showing when she had played Bach beautifully as a reward to a favourite pupil, Fanny Wilmot knew that she was Miss Gray's favourite pupil, that she, too, knew, like other people, about pins. Slater's pins had no points, yes, the famous archaeologist had looked like that too. The famous archaeologist as she said that, endorsing checks, ascertaining the day of the month, speaking so brightly and frankly. There was in Miss Kingston's voice an indescribable tone which hinted at something odd, something queer in Julius Cray, it was the very same thing that was odd perhaps in Julia too. One could have sworn, thought Fanny Wilmot, as she looked for the pin, that at parties, meetings, Miss Kingston's father was a clergyman, she had picked up some piece of gossip, or it might only have been a smile, or a tone when his name was mentioned, which had given her a feeling about Julius Cray. Needless to say, she had never spoken about it to anybody. Probably she scarcely knew what she meant by it. But whenever she spoke of Julius, or heard him mentioned, that was the first thing that came to mind, and it was a seductive thought, there was something odd about Julius Gray. It was so that Julia looked too, as she sat half-turned on the music stool, smiling. It's on the field, 
it's on the pane, it's in the sky beauty, and I can't get at it, I can't have it I, she seemed to add, with that little clutch of the hand which was so characteristic, who adore it so passionately, would give the whole world to possess it. And she picked up the carnation which had fallen on the floor, while Fanny searched for the pin. She crushed it, Fanny felt, voluptuously in her smooth veined hands stuck about with water-colored rings set in pearls. The pressure of her fingers seemed to increase all that was most brilliant in the flower, to set it off, to make it more frilled, fresh, immaculate. What was odd in her, and perhaps in her brother, too, was that this crush and grasp of the finger was combined with a perpetual frustration. So it was even now with the carnation. She had her hands on it, she pressed it, but she did not possess it, enjoy it, not entirely and altogether, none of the craze has married, Fanny Wilmot remembered. She had in mind how one evening when the lesson had lasted longer than usual and it was dark, Julia Cray had said it's the use of men, surely, to protect us, smiling at her that same odd smile, as she stood fastening her cloak, which made her, like the flower, conscious to her fingertips of youth and brilliance, but, like the flower, too, Fanny suspected, made her feel awkward, oh, but I don't want protection, Fanny had laughed, and when Julia Cray, fixing on her that extraordinary look, had said she was not so sure of that, Fanny positively blushed under the admiration in her eyes, it was the only use of men, she had said, was it for that reason then, Fanny wondered, with her eyes on the floor, that she had never married, after all, she had not lived all her life in Salisbury, much the nicest part of London, she had said once, but I'm speaking of fifteen or twenty years ago, is Kensington. One was in the gardens in ten minutes it was like the heart of the country. One could dine out in one's slippers without catching cold. Kensington it was like a village then, you know, she had said, here she broke off, to denounce sacredly the draughts in the tubes. It was the use of men, she had said, with a queer acerbity. Did that throw any light on the problem why she had not married? One could imagine every sort of scene in her youth, when with her good blue eyes, her straight firm nose, her air of cool distinction, her piano playing, her rose flowering with chaste passion in the bosom of her muslin dress, she had attracted first the young men to whom such things, the china teacups and the silver candlesticks and the inlaid table, for the craze had such nice things, were wonderful, young men not sufficiently distinguished, young men of the cathedral town with ambitions. She had attracted them first, and then her brother's friends from Oxford or Cambridge. They would come down in the summer, row her on the river, continue the argument about Browning by letter, and arrange perhaps, on the rare occasions when she stayed in London, to show her Kensington Gardens, much the nicest part of London Kensington, I'm speaking of fifteen or twenty years ago, she had said once. One was in the gardens in ten minutes in the heart of the country. One could make that yield what one liked, Fanny Wilmot thought, single out, for instance, Mr. Sherman, the painter, an old friend of hers, make him call for her, by appointment, one sunny day in June, take her to have tea under the trees. They had met, too, at those parties to which one tripped in slippers without fear of catching cold, the aunt or other elderly relative was to wait there while they looked at the serpentine. They looked at the serpentine. He may have rowed her across. They compared it with the Avon. She would have considered the comparison very furiously. Views of rivers were important to her. She sat hunched a little, a little angular, though she was graceful then, steering. At the critical moment, for he had determined that he must speak now it was his only chance of getting her alone he was speaking with his head turned at an absurd angle, in his great nervousness, over his shoulder at that very moment she interrupted fiercely. He would have them into the bridge, she cried. It was a moment of horror, of disillusionment, of revelation, for both of them. I can't have it, I can't possess it, she thought. He could not see why she had come then. With a great splash of his oar he pulled the boat round. Merely to snub him? He rowed her back and said goodbye to her. The setting of that scene could be varied as one chose, Fanny Wilmot reflected. Where had that pin fallen? It might be Ravenna, or Edinburgh, where she had kept house for her brother. The scene could be changed, and the young man and the exact manner of it all. But one thing was constant her refusal, and her frown, and her anger with herself afterwards, and her argument and her relief yes, 
certainly her immense relief. The very next day, perhaps, she would get up at six, put on her cloak, and walk all the way from Kensington to the river. She was so thankful that she had not sacrificed her right to go and look at things when they are at their best before people are up, that is to say she could have her breakfast in bed if she liked. She had not sacrificed her independence, yes, Fanny Wilmot smiled, Julia had not endangered her habits. They remained safe, and her habits would have suffered if she had married. There are girls, she had said one evening, half laughing, when another pupil, a girl lately married, suddenly bethinking her that she would miss her husband, had rushed off in haste, there are girls, she had said, laughing grimly. An ogre would have interfered perhaps with breakfast in bed, with walks at dawn down to the river. What would have happened, but one could hardly conceive this, had she had children. She took astonishing precautions against chills, fatigue, rich food, the wrong food, draughts, heated rooms, journeys in the tube. For she could never determine which of these it was exactly that brought on those terrible headaches that gave her life the semblance of a battlefield. She was always engaged in outwitting the enemy, until it seemed as if the pursuit had its interest, could she have beaten the enemy finally she would have found life a little dull. As it was, the tug of war was perpetual on the one side the nightingale or the view which she loved with passion yes, for views and birds she felt nothing less than passion, on the other the damp path or the horrid long drag up a steep hill which would certainly make her good for nothing next day and bring on one of her headaches. When, therefore, from time to time, she managed her forces adroitly and brought off a visit to Hampton Court the week the crocuses those glossy bright flowers were her favourite were at their best, it was a victory. It was something that lasted, something that mattered forever. She strung the afternoon on the necklace of memorable days, which was not too long for her to be able to recall this one or that one, this view, that city, to finger it, to feel it, to savour, sighing, the quality that made it unique. It was so beautiful last Friday, she said, that I determined I must go there. So she had gone off to Waterloo on her great undertaking to visit Hampton Court alone. Naturally, but perhaps foolishly, one pitied her for the things she never asked pity for. Indeed she was reticent habitually, speaking of her health only as a warrior might speak of his foe one pitied her for always doing everything alone. Her brother was dead. Her sister was asthmatic. She found the climate of Edinburgh good for her. It was too bleak for Julia. Perhaps, too, she found the associations painful, for her brother, the famous archaeologist, had died there, and she had loved her brother. She lived in a little house off the Brompton Road entirely alone. Fanny Wilmot saw the pin, she picked it up. She looked at Miss Grey. Was Miss Grey so lonely? No, Miss Grey was steadily, blissfully, if only for that moment a happy woman. Fanny had surprised her in a moment of ecstasy. She sat there, half turned away from the piano, with her hands clasped in her lap holding the carnation upright, while behind her was the sharp square of the window, uncurtained, purple in the evening, intensely purple after the brilliant electric lights which burned unshaded in the bare music room. Julia Cray, sitting hunched and compact holding her flower, seemed to emerge out of the London night, seemed to fling it like a cloak behind her, it seemed, in its bareness and intensity, the effluence of her spirit, something she had made which surrounded her. Fanny stared, all seemed transparent, for a moment, to the gaze of Fanny Wilmot, as if looking through Miss Cray, she saw the very fountain of her being spurting its pure silver drops. She saw back and back into the past behind her. She saw the green Roman vases stood in their case, heard the choristers playing cricket, saw Julia quietly descend the curving steps onto the lawn, then saw her pour out tea beneath the cedar tree, softly enclose the old man's hand in hers, saw her going round and about the corridors of that ancient cathedral dwelling place with towels in her hand to mark them, lamenting, as she went, the pettiness of daily life, and slowly aging, and putting away clothes when summer came, because at her age they were too bright to wear, and tending her father's sickness, and cleaving her way ever more definitely as her will stiffened towards her solitary goal, travelling frugally, counting the cost and measuring out of her tight shut purse the sum needed for this journey or for that old mirror, obstinately adhering, whatever people might say, in choosing her pleasures for herself. She saw Julia, Julia blazed, Julia kindled. 
Out of the night she burned like a dead white star. Julia opened her arms. Julia kissed her on the lips. Julia possessed it. Slater's pins have no points, Miss Gray said, laughing queerly and relaxing her arms, as Fanny Wilmot pinned the flower to her breast with trembling fingers.